Good morning. Put that one away and use this one. And Wednesday, did you see the sunrise? Did you notice how it changed from pink to gold? And it took about 10 minutes to do that. It was so pretty. Please join me in Mark chapter 3. We've made great progress. Mark chapter 3, and I'll be reading from New International Version to begin with, and then I think I get lost into the message. <clears throat> Another time, Jesus went to the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Do you think anybody knew he was coming that day? Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Do you think anybody knew he was going to be there that day? Sure they did. In fact, chances are, if he didn't attend that church regularly, somebody planted him because they said, come on, come on, you need to come over today. It's going to be fascinating. There's this new guy coming into town. He's supposed to be a really good speaker, and every once in a while he heals people. He might even help carry your hand. Now, how do you get a shriveled hand? And what does that mean? Does it mean it shrivels up and you don't see it anymore? It kind of becomes like a little flap? Does it mean that uh, one day when you're out working on masonry, you get your hand between two large blocks, and the next thing you know, you have a hand that no longer receives commands from your nervous system? That would shrivel it. It would mean that it was useless. The syn synonym in this area could easily be useless. He had a hand that wouldn't work. Now, if you are a person who lives by your hands and one of them no longer works, you lose about 80% of your capacity. Because how many times to use one hand do you need another to help it? And if you're stuck where you're a mason, you're a carpenter, you're a fisherman, you need both of those hands, or chances are you're not going to do much of anything. And Jesus came to church, and by chance, God's chance, there was a man there that Sabbath with a shriveled hand. Okay, I'm going to shift to the message translation. Then he went back to the meeting place where he found a man with a crippled hand. The Pharisees had their eyes on Jesus to see if he would heal him, <laughs> hoping to catch him in a Sabbath infraction. And Jesus said to the man with the crippled hand, can you imagine the, the tension that day at church? Man, everybody is alert. Bill is here. Oh, Bill, the fisherman. Yeah, remember when he wrecked his hand? That was awful. We thought it was going to tear it clear off when it got caught in the rope, come pulling the net in that day. Man, poor guy hasn't been able to fish successfully since. His family's just about starving to death. And Jesus turned to the man with the crippled hand and said, Stand up where we can all see you. Uh, New International. Stand up in front of everyone. <laughs> you imagine? The Pharisees have Jesus set up. They're made, they've made sure that uh, old Bell with his crippled hand is going to be in church. They've made sure that Jesus is going to be there. They've set Bill where he's easy to see. They've set him where his crippled hand is obvious because uh, he, he's always worried about it, trying to hide it, trying to move it, trying to keep it still. <laughs> And Jesus notices. I think the most important part of this story is that Jesus noticed. Just think about that for a minute. Well, the story is here because of what happened next, but I think the story is here because of what has just happened. Jesus noticed. He looked out and he, he saw the needs, not just of old Bill and his crippled hand. He saw Mary. Bill's wife. He saw Maria. He saw Frank. He saw Steve. He saw you. He saw me. And he realized our crippledness. 
for none of us come whole. All of us come with something missing, something cracked, something broken, something needy, something leaking, something stuck up. Come up front where we can all see you, your defect, your brokenness, your need. Come up here. I want you to be close to me. And we're in this together, by the way. Is that beautiful? That's the story in Mark chapter 3. In Mark chapter 5, and let's bounce there with, you, with me if you would for just a moment. Um, Got to get to my right spot here. Well, I know where it is in the message really quick. Mark 4, verse 26. And Jesus said, God's kingdom is like seed thrown on a field by a man who then goes to bed and forgets about it. The seed sprouts and grows. He has no idea how that happens. The earth does it all without his help. First a green stem of grass, then the bud, then the ripened grain. And when the grain is fully formed, he reaps. It's harvest time. How can we picture God's kingdom? What kind of a story can we use? Well, it's like a pine nut. When it lands on the ground, it is quite small as seeds go. Yet once it is planted, it grows into a huge pine tree with thick branches. Eagles nest in it. <clears throat> with many stories like these, he presented his message to them, fitting the stories to their experience and maturity. He was never without a story when he spoke. Now, think about that. He was never without a story when he spoke. I one time was standing in front of the airport in Denver. I had just picked up a guest speaker for the weekend for an event in Colorado. And as we were talking about the event for the weekend, uh, the name of a good friend came up, a good friend of mine, a man that I've come to respect greatly for his ability to weave a story that holds so much more than you would ever have dreamt you could talk about at one moment. And I mentioned his name, and the guy who was with me said, oh, you don't want to invite him to come to stuff like this. He's just a storyteller. Which brings me back to uh, Jesus. He was never without a story when he spoke. With many stories, he presented his message to them, fitting the stories with their experience and maturity. Now that brings me back to chapter 3. For there Jesus is, and he is bringing a story to church. The story's name is Bill. The story's name is the Pharisees who made sure Bill would be there. The story's name is everybody in the congregation who knows the guy with the shriveled hand, the hand that doesn't work anymore, the hand that has made it impossible for him to do his normal work, the hand that has brought hunger to his family. It's a story ready to be told. It's a story being told. It's a story God has made sure is part of church. Stand up in front of us. And then Jesus looks out, his eyes capturing the eyes of every Pharisee in the crowd. They look away. Pharisees tend to do that. And then Jesus asks them, I have a question for you. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Is it lawful to do good or to do evil, to save life? or to kill on the Sabbath. And they all say, what's he talking about? I don't know. What does that have to do with anything? I don't know. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or to do evil? He asks again. 
Then he looks around at them, and you'll only find this in this place in Scripture. He looked around at them. In anger, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. It isn't very often that you find, and Jesus was angry, is it? And Jesus wept. Yeah. They wrote that down because it was news. Jesus was the kind of guy who was fun to be with. He was the laugh. He was the joker. He was the fun person. He was the one who made everybody happy. And when Jesus cried, immediately people, all the newsmen are writing that down. And Jesus wept. Whoa, hadn't seen that before. Put it on at six. Lead with it. On this day, Jesus looks at them and he realizes that church is packed with people waiting for him to do something wrong. So they can accuse him of it. He looked around at them in anger, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. The man knew he couldn't do it. He tried for years. He tried to stretch out his hand to reach his other hand. He tried to stretch out his hand to reach his wife. He tried to stretch out his hand for his kids. He tried to do his work. It wouldn't work. But Jesus, with him standing in front of his family, says, hey, Bill, <clears throat> stretch your hand out. And Bill, almost involuntarily responding to the request, the command of God, stretches out his hand. And his hand was completely restored. The word used means made as if new all over again. Can you imagine? First thing he does is shake his own hand. Oh, I can do it again. Look at this. Marge. <laughs> oh, his name was, he got the right wife. Don't worry. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Why would you want to kill somebody? Because he made some man's hand work. Hmm? And it's interesting. The word that's used here is the word that is a synonym for malice. They weren't just angry. They weren't just enraged. They were filled with malice, looking for a way to damage Jesus. Looking for a way to damage Jesus. Today's story is about how we as people are uncomfortable with God. God's too easy, and we want to make him more complex. We want to put him in a little box and say, it, this is the way God operates. I, you need to learn about that, but we're over here living our way. But when God conflicts with what we do, we've got to put him back in his box because God can really be uncomfortable when he's around a lot. And when Jesus showed up and was around a lot, people got really uncomfortable with him. Some of them, some of them went, whoopee, bring grandma. Maybe we can get her well again. Others said, hey, let's see if we can get Bill in here. I'll bet you Jesus would heal on the Sabbath, and then we can get rid of him. Why did they want to get rid of him? He was healing Bill. Why did they want to get rid of him? Because he was slipping out of the God box and getting involved in people's lives on Sabbath, no less. I have a good friend who's a pastor of a large church in Oregon. He and I were talking about this verse a few weeks ago, and, and I said, what, is it, what does this mean to you? He said, well, let me give you an illustration, Dick. A few months ago, <clears throat> well, actually, three years ago, a young lady in our congregation became pregnant. It was rape, but nobody understood or asked they just saw that she was growing. And they came to the church board and decided she was not acceptable in the church anymore because she was not married. And they 
this fellowship her from a Seventh-day Adventist congregation for being pregnant out of wedlock. Um, that may sound like it's rare. I have far too many stories like that, current ones. This is current. She had the baby, gave it away for adoption, and just a few months ago decided she would come back to church after long conversations with my pastor friend. I want to come back. I, I really feel God calling me to come, but I'm afraid of the people. I'm afraid to come to where the expectations are so clear there is no room for forgiveness to do its work. And the pastor said, it's not that way anymore. The church has changed. She'll be fine. Come on. And so she came. She came to church as requested, invited by the pastor, but she came dressed in her best, which because of the life she had been leading most recently in the, in the town she lived in was bright orange spiked hair, a uh, set of clothes that certainly didn't match the uh, dress code on the front wall of the church and bright red high heels. She was met at the door by one of the bouncers <laughs> who looked at her and said, this is God's church. You don't come dressed that way, honey. And she walked out, called the pastor that week and said, lose my phone. It's not safe to come home. And the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians, their death enemies, on how together they might kill Jesus. You see, when God slips out of the box in which we have safely put him, and begins to infiltrate our daily life in the way we dress or don't dress, in the way we act or don't act, in the way we speak or don't speak, and whatever it is, when somehow he doesn't fit our expectations, we'll do anything we can to put him back in his box. That's why the story is here. But remember how it begins? Jesus went to church, the safest place on the planet is the church, right? Should be. So Jesus goes to church on Sabbath morning, and Bill is there with his shriveled hand, and Jesus sees him. And Jesus walks over and says, only whole people in here, sorry, babe. If he had done that, the Pharisees would have praised his name. If he had done that, the Pharisees would have put his name in lights and done their very best to call him Messiah, King, trustworthy, my God. Instead, he said, Bill, come on up here. Hold out your hand. And the power of Christ healed Bill's hand. And now God is completely out of the box. And the people who want to put him back in are shoving for all their worth. And the word that's best described their attitude is malice. Kill him. And if we've got to use the sheriff to do it, bring him on. Verse 7, and Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. And when they heard all that he was doing, many people came, from, came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, and Dumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. And because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready. <laughs> 
to keep the people from drowning him. It says crowding, but drowning is the right word. We had healed so many that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. And whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God! But he commanded them, Not here. It's not time. Be quiet. If I bounce again to chapter 4, he never went anywhere without a story. I'd like to suggest that he never went anywhere without giving people stories. Imagine. He calls the disciples and says, look, would you have a boat ready? These people are totally undisciplined and unruly. And the most important thing that you can do to help me today is to take care of the crowd. And to do that, I need a boat that I can get in so that they can't get to me. Otherwise, we're all going to drown. (laughs) <laughs> and he chuckles, and they say, a boat? A boat! <laughs> Have it ready, we're going to need it. And a little bit later, when they pull up to the shore, because Jesus is now waist deep in the water, trying to talk to people and heal people, but to do it without drowning, he looks up and says, thanks for the boat! And they said, we understand, Master, now we understand. It was a hilarious moment. And he climbs into the boat, And they help him sit down on some of the uh, boxes of fish. Well, there are no fish now, but he sits there and he talks to the people all day long. I believe he healed at a distance, not always having to touch. Frank, how's your hearing? What? (laughs) Your wife says you're going deaf. I I don't have any dogs. (laughs) And Jesus says, all right, Frank, you're going to hear now. Ah, whoa, whoa, whoa. Man, it's loud out here. What is that you said? He said, go home, take care of your cats. I don't have any cats either. <laughs> and everybody's laughing uproariously because Frank can hear. The old deaf dude. Everything that went was a story. And everybody who went home told a story to somebody else who told a story to somebody else. And being where Jesus was was a story party. Don't you love that? One day, my wife Brenda and I walked into a, uh, to a tiny village in the mountains of Nagaland, northeastern India. We were there to do some advance work to see if this was a good place to put a school was already a school there, but rumor was they needed a, a new set of buildings. They took us to the buildings. That was very obvious. They needed a new set of buildings because you could stand anywhere in any of those buildings and look up and know that there was sunshine or no sunshine or rain or dry or whatever because there were so many holes in the roof. And wherever there was a hole in the roof, that meant water came onto the ground. Well, the ground or the floor in all the school rooms was dirt. And so when it rained, it became mud, became inaccessible, and they had to close school because there was, you know, you can't go to school in the, in the lake. And that's basically what the classrooms began. So we talked, spent time, agreed it was a really good idea to put a school here, Twang Seventh-day Adventist School. And then one of the old men came over and put his hand on my elbow, and he said, may I tell you a story? No, I don't have time. Right? No, anytime there's an opportunity to hear when somebody says, may I tell you a story? That's like, uh, please turn on your phone quick. Get this down. There's something here God wants you to hear. Here's the story. Three Seventh-day Adventist families living in the state of Mizoram. Now, Mizoram is not misery. Don't get those mixed up. It could have been. I don't know. But it, This is Mizoram. If you go into uh, the history of India and Pakistan and the British, when the British divorced the Muslim countries and the Hindu countries, uh, there were seven states that connected what is today Pakistan and what is India. Nobody knew what to do with them. It was really awful, uncomfortable, frustrating, any word you want to use. Uh, They shifted everything around, and if you look at India today, it's like an ice cream cone, right? Just kind of straight down, pointy at the end, and and the Himalayas at the top. But off over on this side in the top right is a thumb 
of seven states. Those are seven states that were neither Hindu nor Muslim. They were wild, crazy people. Uh, the Sikkim lived there. Remember you used to tell your dog, Sikkim! It was the nastiest thing you could have a dog do was Sikkim! Well, that was the name of some of the people who lived way up in the northern part of these seven states. The state of Mizoram was one. The state of uh, Nagaland is another. And, and just Google them sometime. Google Nagaland and learn about the great Nagas and their Naga knives. The bamboo goose grows so close together in Nagaland that you can't find a trail through the mountains most of the time. And so you use a Naga knife. It's like a machete, but it's got a hook on the end, and all sides are uh, honed to sharp perfection. And you take that knife, you turn it sideways, and you slip it through, and then you cut the bamboo towards you with that incredibly sharp steel blade. Uh, and the Nagas are good at it. The Nagas were known during the Second World War as some of the strongest, fiercest fighters that were on the Allied side. Stories never stop, it seems, when you start getting into Naga history. But in Mizoram, three young families had met Jesus Christ. And one night, they had a dream. One of the men tells me that all three men had the dream at the same time. Another tells me that over different nights, they all had the same dream. But the three families heard God speak the same message. And the message when they got together and sat one, one day was, leave the safety of your home go to Nagaland and teach about Jesus. Well, these three Seventh-day Adventist families, uh, they were members of a very small congregation just beginning to grow. There wasn't much there at all. They decided that they were supposed to follow. So they sold everything they had. That didn't take long. Put what was left in basically small blankets, tied them on their backs, took their children and their knives and began to walk into Nagaland. There were no trails. There were no roads. There were no highways. There was no air service. There were just three families immigrating across the border. They went into the trees. They found their way. Weeks later, they came to a highland that there was kind of flat on top and on two sides was a bit of a valley where people had planted rice. The three families planted tents of a sort in the forest, went to the people and offered to help with the rice. Where did you come from? How are you? Where are you from? They could speak just enough language that was similar that they started to communicate. They went down, they started working, the people appreciated their work and paid them a little bit of money just in food to be able to stay alive as they continued to work. Day after day, week after week, three weeks actually. The first Sabbath when they didn't show it was okay. The second Sabbath when they didn't show it started a little bit of a conversation. The third Sabbath when it didn't show they were told they had to work. And they said, well, you know, we're Seventh-day Adventists and we worship the great God who created everything and he asked us to worship on Saturday. And so Saturday is the day that we will not be able to come and work with you. We're very sorry, but that's the way uh, he has asked us to live. As they worshiped, they realized that they were not alone. They were being watched. Sunday morning, there were no jobs. By Wednesday, they were needed again, and so they, they had jobs. But when Friday came, and they said that they were going to have to go back into the forest and worship, they were told there would never be jobs again, ever. You are sorcerers! You have come to destroy us by bringing the devil's curses upon us. We have watched you. We have watched you and him sing together and pray and praise. We know you are sorcerers. You may not ever come into our village again. Sunday, members of the Assam Rifles, crack Indian troops, and a giant 4x4 truck 
arrived on what is called a road and arrested the three men from the three families. You are sorcerers. The mayor has demanded and all the people of this village have demanded that you will be taken to jail in Dimapur, in the capital. They put steel manacles on their wrists, steel manacles on their ankles, threw them into the back of the truck with guards with rifles at the ready and began the drive for how many hours crashing down the ruts to where a judge was to declare them sorcerers to be killed. Halfway down the mountain, the oldest man, I'll call him Anthony, when he was telling me the story, the tears were just flowing down his face. He said, halfway down, Pastor, very, this is tr double translation, halfway down, Pastor, I looked down at my hands and the, the bracelets had come off. And I said, what? And he said, halfway down the mountain, I looked down at my hands, and the bracelets had come off my hand. They were, I was holding them now, and the ones from my feet the same. And I was holding my feet bracelets, and, my, uh, my, and I held them up to the soldier, and I said, my bracelets have come off. What do I do? And he said, the soldier just looked at me and said, if your God wants the bracelets to come off and for you to be free, I will not touch you. And neither will the judge. You will be free. Free indeed. Well, within 48 hours, the judge in Dimapur had reminded the mayor and the others that in India, which is a country where freedom of religion reigns, you can be a sorcerer if you want. And if they're sorcerers, I don't know. That's up to you. That's up to them to be what they choose. But you cannot persecute them for what they believe or do. If they have new gods, Hindus have new ones all the time. So be it. They sent them home. The mayor was absolutely infuriated. And anger moved to rage, moved to malice. In the middle of the night, the mayor and some of the others bribed a group of young men to, with enough uh, alcoholic beverage that the young men did whatever they were asked to do. And they went to the house of the old man, Andrew. Come out so we can kill you! <laughs> what a stupid request. Come out so we can kill you! And Andrew said, no! I will not come out. If you kill me, you must come into my Seventh-day Adventist house to kill me. He's a sorcerer. Don't go in. And then the young men, well, the way Andrew put it, they chopped my house down. I never asked any more. It included fire, I know that. But they chopped his house down. Now, when you think of the Naga Knives, and you th it, I'm not sure what they did that night, but what ended up happening is that Andrew and his family were pulled outside and watched as their house and the little barn that they had built for their one cow and the cow were chopped down. There was nothing left. In the morning... The three families came together at the chopped down house, knowing they were watched, knowing not what to do. They prayed, and a young teenage boy, who is now one of the elders of the Twang Church, said, I know what Jesus would do. Oh, if this man would join all the committees I've yet to visit. <laughs> I know what Jesus would do. What would Jesus do? Son, 
Jesus would take the one cow our families have left. He would chop it down, butcher it, and prepare it with whatever elder food we can find. And then he would invite all of the people in the Twang area, all of the people on the hills, all of the people in the paddies, he would invite them all to a celebration of the goodness of Jesus Christ right here on the chopped down house. The three of families agreed that was a pretty good idea. And so they did exactly that. They killed and butchered the cow. They gathered all the vegetables they could get their hands on. They found some big stew pots. And they began inviting people to a party. A party of celebration of life on the chopped down house. Everybody came. The mayor came. His kids came. The guys who, who, who did the chopping came. Everybody came from as far away as you could hear about the story. There's a group of sorcerers who want you all to come to a party on top of the house we chopped down. You had to come. And they greeted everyone with stories of Jesus, the healer. Hmm. And then they invited the uh, three Adventist families to come back to work. And they worked. They worked hard. And as the kids realized that, that they needed to be going to school, one of the moms said, well, I'll start a school and we'll start teaching. And so they began this little school process, but things, they needed more land. They needed a place that they could really have a school. So Andrew went to the mayor and to the city council in this little village and demanded that they be given land for a church and school. And the mayor said, over my dead body. And Andrew said, according to the law of Nagaland and India, any religious group who wants to build a church is to be given land to build the church. That's true. All right. And so over the mayor's not quite dead body, the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church was given seven acres for a church and a school. The town swamp. Nobody ever went there. There were tigers in the swamp. There were adders. There were cobras. There were jaguars. There were elephants. It was a nasty place. It was seven acres of hell on the edge of the town. Give the Adventists the swamp. Ha, ha, ha. But Andrew had made a friend. One day out in the woods working, he'd come across the guy who is working for the country of India, and his responsibility is managing the forests. And they'd become friends, and so Andrew sent a message, I need to talk. And the next time the guy was in the area, he took him over to see the new church land. This is a swamp. I know, I wanted you to see it. Would you help me? And the supervisor for all of for, uh, the forests in Nagaland said, yeah, I will. A few weeks later, a giant truck carrying a D8 bright yellow caterpillar bulldozer, a big cat, comes trundling up the ruts. About the time it gets to the, the area where the swamp begins, the driver does something and the engine goes <laughs> as if it's dying. Ah, oh, no, he said. And he goes and he lifts up the hood and tinkers a while. And he says, well, that's going to take some parts. And he gets off and he says, I've got, I think, uh, six days permit to come up here and work on your swamp. But I'm going to have, it looks like I got trouble with my truck, so I, I'll stay for a while longer, maybe. Six weeks later. People went to the mayor and the city council and said, How come you gave the Adventists the nicest land in town? 
It was smooth, it was level, it was beautiful, and it was on the edge of a little bit of a forest, and the swamp made a beautiful creek right down the middle. And the man in the uh, bulldozer went over to his truck and said, well, I'll be, I think it's going to start. And the cat went down the hill, and the school began. A few months later, a couple people from town came over and said, you know, your kids are awfully good. They're, they're learning something special. Would you mind if we joined? And then one day the mayor came over and he said, you know, I've got two kids who, who don't, would you mind if, uh, and if you go to the town today, the Twang Seventh-day Adventist School is the place to go to school. This cool little stream, brand new buildings, and old Andrew, smiling, remembering a night when he dreamed he was to leave the comfort of home and go to Nagaland and tell people about Jesus. Isn't that cool? Jesus never went anywhere without giving away stories. When he met Andrew, he said, I've got stories for you, Andrew. Let's live them together. When he met old Bill, standing there now in front of the church with his shriveled hand, Jesus says, oh, Bill, do we have a story to tell. Just give me your hand. Verse 20 of chapter 3. <clears throat> Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. And when his family heard about him, they went to take charge of them. For they said, he's out of his mind. I love Mary. I can hear her. He's doing what? I told that kid, I don't care what it is you think God wants you to do. Be sure and eat breakfast. They were not even able to eat. And when his family heard about it, they went to take charge of him. Don't you love that picture? It is, it is well, look at it in the message. It's just a different way to hear exactly the same set of words. Uh, Mark chapter 320. Ta -da -ta -ta. Jesus came home, and as usual, a crowd gathered, so many making demands on him that there wasn't even time to eat. His friends and family heard what was going on and went to rescue him by force if necessary. They suspected he was getting carried away with himself. <laughs> The rest of this talks about being a sorcerer. Read the chapter when you get back someplace today, would you? Chapter 3 of Mark, verses 22 and on, and then verse 31. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. <laughs> Just then his mother and brothers showed up. Standing outside, they relayed a message that they wanted a word with him. Tell Jesus I want to talk to him now. He was surrounded by the crowd when he was given the message. Your mother and your brother are outside, or, and your sisters. It does say sisters. It's the only place we know for sure that Jesus had sisters. So he was tempted in all ways. <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> your mother and your brothers and your sisters are outside looking for you. And Jesus responded, who do you think are my brothers and brothers? And looking around him, taking in all those seated in the circle, he said, You are my mothers and my brothers. For whoever does God's will is my brother, my sister, and my mother. And everyone knew he was out of his mind. Do you think that uh, the Pharisees were happy when they heard him saying such malarkey? No, because now Jesus was so far out of the box that nobody knew what to do with him. Even his mother had given up. What am I supposed to do? 
He won't eat. He's so busy doing healing and stuff and talking and, and telling stories that he won't even have breakfast. He's not going to have energy to tell anything more before lunch. James, go get him. Marita, go get him. Please tell Jesus mom is out here and we want to talk to him. Oh, my mother and my brother and my sisters are outside? Oh, well, you know, that's not a problem because all of you are my mother and brothers and sisters. And the people go, he's lost it. And his mother says, help him! And Jesus says, finally, I'm out of the box of expectations so that I can live in the box of my Father's love. Lord, help us understand whatever it is you bring us, whatever it is that drops in our way, whatever it is you ask us to do, help us to remember that if, if we're out to try and change you, the malice has taken over. Help us to just listen and follow wherever that leads. And thanks that you promise an adventure. Amen.